uh, I uh, I'm going to get uh, continue in Exodus this morning. But before I do, I, I just I want to go kind of where I think angels even fear to tread at times. And I have a question: um, Are there any White Sox fans in the room here today? There are. You put your hands up high. Be if you're. It's okay. All right. What about any Cubs fans here? My goodness, it's the north side, you know, of the city. I, I'm not a fan of baseball, uh, you know, and. Uh, I, don't, I don't even know if it's baseball season right now. I'm just kidding. I know some things. Uh, but I moved here from the D.C. area, and uh, because of that, I you know, didn't really get that into uh, the local baseball scene here. Baltimore Orioles were my team growing up, and uh, I didn't even know about some of the things that I heard were going on here. Like there's a curse, right, on the Cubs. And how many people believe in the curse that is on the Cubs? Not even, not even one hand, because you're in church. When you're at work, you all are like, yeah, the Cubs are cursed, but here you uh, know that we don't <laughs> necessarily believe in that. <laughs> but uh, it's so crazy. I just read up on uh, the curse of the Cubs, and um, it was just so crazy, this story. You guys, uh, there are many different kinds of curses, but the one that was very intriguing to me was the Billy Goat curse. You guys know about this? Billy Goat Tavern, you know, uh, cheeseburger, cheeseburger, that whole thing. You can even get a Billy Goat uh, hamburger in um, O'Hare Airport, uh, but the Billy Goat Tavern, this is the Billy Goat curse. On October 6, 1945, William Billy Goat Sienis, who owned the Billy Goat Tavern, he actually grew his beard just like you, like I used to as well, and he looked like a Billy Goat, and he brought his Billy Goat into the stadium in Game 4 of the World Series between the Chicago Cubs and the Detroit Tigers. He bought two tickets in advance, and when he showed up there at the ticket counter, they turned him away and said, you can't bring this goat in. Well, why can't I bring the goat in? Because the goat smells. He says, I'm bringing the goat in. They said, you can't bring the goat in. They refused it. So they bring uh, Wrigley, who owns the Cubs. He comes, because Billy Goat, you know, this guy's a pretty famous guy in the city. And so he comes. He says, listen, you can come in, but your goat can't come. And as soon as he was not allowed to come in, he says this, the Cubs ain't going to win no more. The Cubs will never win a World Series so long as the GOAT is not allowed in Wrigley Field. They lost that series and continued to have the difficulties that we all know for many years. 1969, uh, Billy claimed that the, the curse was lifted, but he said that the GOAT is still a little bit upset. <laughs> 1973, uh, Billy, the father, is now passed on, and his nephew, Sam Sienis, he brought the goat to Wrigley Field in a black limousine. There was a red carpet. There was a sign saying, all is forgiven. Let me lead the Cubs to the pennant. But the goat was not allowed to get in, and they lost another season. Fast forward, 1984. The Tribune Company is now the new owners of the Chicago Cubs, and Sam Sienis and the goat were invited to come on to the field. And they walked on with a sign that said, the curse is lifted. And they won that year. And they won, and they won, and they won. And they lose in the World Series that year. And the reason, according to Sam Sienis, is he was waiting for the call to fly him and the goat out to San Diego, but they lost because the goat was not there at the final World Series game that they lost. How many of you believe in curses? Believe in curses. Maybe you don't believe in uh, the curses I'm going to talk about here today a little bit, but um, how about this? There's a ladder here. If I was smaller, I could walk under it. Some of you will avoid ladders at all costs because you just don't want to take a chance of walking underneath a ladder. Maybe some of you are like that. When I was a kid, I used to skip all of the, the, um, the cracks, right? And I'd walk, I'd be walking. It's so funny watching people doing this. And it's, I was even a grown man, and I'd find myself doing this from time to time, just avoiding all the cracks. And you, it's just, a, what's going on with this guy? That's the way you walk sometimes. Like, and the reason is because the cracks, they are holes to the underworld, and you don't want to walk on the cracks lest you be cursed. There's different things like that through the ages that have been said. Um, here's an umbrella. And uh, umbrellas, I know you guys know this, but I don't care. I really, I don't believe in it. It doesn't bother me. But some of you are just like, there's something coming to you. Listen, if something does happen to me, it is not because of the umbrella. 
All right, it's none of those things. It was, it was my time, okay? That's all. That's all I'm going to say. That is what I believe about the Lord. His timing is perfect, and uh, all of the things that we uh, fear uh, with these curses, they are just made up. Some of you will get freaked out if a black cat crosses your path, and uh, it doesn't bother me at all because I uh, am not buying into any of those things, but this idea of blessing and curses is in the Bible. It is in the Bible. There is a theology of blessing and curse, and we find it right here, even in the beginning of Exodus. As we start off and think about this, I want you to think about what it means to be blessed, to be blessed. The book of Genesis is all about blessing, just out of God's love, out of his overflow of who he is. He blessed and he created the world and spoke it into existence and gave human beings an opportunity to live. There was blessing. God planted. God gave. And we, if we were faithful to God, the blessing continues to come our way. And God makes covenants with his people that through obedience you will continue to be blessed. But a curse is not far off. Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, blessing, blessing, blessing. Chapter 3, the curse comes, and it comes when the first people, they took of that fruit and they ate it, and with that came a curse upon the world. Punishment for disobedience, separation from God, kicked out of the garden, so many consequences that have come the way of people. The story of Exodus is a story of blessing and curses. Israel is going to experience God's blessing in being set free. But Egypt is going to experience curse by their treatment of the people of Israel. God said it would happen to anyone that was against God's people. He promised it as part of the covenant. And so the title of the message today is The Blessing and Curse of God. The Blessing and Curse of God. Of God, Let's continue, just read again where we were. We're right in the beginning of Exodus, so if you're just visiting a couple times, uh, you are not too far off from where we started. You can watch last week's message online and you can catch up. It says this, These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. Last week we talked about how the people of Israel, Jacob, how they came to be in Egypt. Joseph's prosperity, Joseph's abundance, the favor upon him, and then what ends up happening to these people. That's the story of Exodus. Joseph died with his brothers in that generation. He went from the pit to the palace. He had favor with God. That brings us to the text for today, starting at verse 7. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. The blessing and curse of God. First, let's talk about Israel. Israel is blessed, blessed by God's covenant, or blessed because of God's covenant with them. But the people of Israel were fruitful. Listen to these words. There's covenant language right here in the text. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. This is the first time that they are actually called a people, the people of Israel. We say that all the time now, the people of Israel, the people of Israel. This is the first time. The people, the people, they have gone from just being a person, Israel, from being a person, Abraham, and then Isaac, Jacob, Israel, they've actually now become a people. There is a large group of them. By the time of the Exodus, which is coming up uh, shortly, not too far off, but by the time the Exodus happens where they leave Israel, there were 600,000 men. If you figure adding women and children, at least 2 million people people in the exodus they are a people but understand what's happening here we got to go back again back to genesis last week you're like we were in genesis last week well we're going to slow down and we're going to go back to genesis we're going to get through all of chapter one but we need to understand this idea of the covenant you got to understand god's covenant or you will not understand exodus you need to understand how jacob 
Joseph ended up in Israel to understand Exodus, and you also need to understand covenant. Joseph is dead in his generation. We don't know exactly how many years it's been. Uh, in uh, Exodus 12, it says 430 years was how long they were in Egypt. I was trying to figure it all out, but my mind was exploding just trying to try to understand it. But let's just say 430 years of slavery of living there. We don't know exactly how many years they're in captivity, maybe 250, 300. A lot of estimates are out there, but they are in slavery for a long time. And the people are just doing what they're supposed to do. They're being fruitful and multiplying. In our study of Exodus and the whole Bible, for that matter, even to understand what Jesus has done in the new covenant with his blood, we have to understand covenant. A covenant theology. Here's a definition of covenant. It is a sacred kinship bond between two parties. It's ratified by the swearing of an oath. We have a definition, I think, coming up on the screen. A sacred kinship bond between two parties ratified by the swearing of an oath. We don't have it. Okay. An agreement between two parties that specifies requirements for at least one party and includes blessing and curses for obedience or failure. In the case of Israel, God made a covenant with them, and he would fulfill his part. Let's first talk about Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, though not explicitly laid out, there is a covenant between God and Adam and Eve. You can see it in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. It says, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Whenever you see fruitful and multiply and fill, just your mind should go, that's covenant language. Fruitful, multiply, fill. We see it in Exodus chapter 1, verse 7. It's also here in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. See, Moses wrote Exodus. Moses wrote Genesis. And we see this unity of language around covenant right here. That's Adam. What about Noah? Genesis chapter 9, verse 1, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. You see it again. This language is repeated over and over again. Abraham, Genesis 12, 2, And I will make a, of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. He's still not fruitful. He's an old man, but he is going to make a great nation out of him. Genesis 17, 1 to 6, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, there it is, and I will make you into nations, and the king and king shall come from you. Multiply, be fruitful. Nations and kings are coming from Abraham. Let's consider Isaac. It's Adam, Noah, Abraham, now Isaac. This is his son, Isaac. Genesis 22, verse 15. And the angel of the Lord called to Abram, Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son. I will surely bless you, talking to Abraham, because Abraham didn't sacrifice, was willing to sacrifice Isaac. I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand on the seashore. It hasn't happened yet, but it's coming through Isaac. Genesis 26, 22 to 24. And he moved from there, this is Isaac now, and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it, so he called its name Rehoboth. I call it Rehoboth because I'm from the East Coast, and that's what we were beach called Rehoboth. It may be Rehoboth, I don't know, but I just cannot unsay that. Rehoboth saying, for now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful. You see it? Fruitful in the land. From there he went to Beersheba, and the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham, your father. Fear not. For I am with you and will bless you and multiply your offspring for my servant Abraham's sake. 
Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel in time. <clears throat> but Jacob, Genesis 35, verse 11, And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you. The kings shall come from your own body. The land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I will give to you, and I will give the land to your offspring after you. God is a covenant keeper. And throughout Genesis, we see the covenant being laid out with God and his people, and Abraham is going to be the start of it. And now the people has become the people. Exodus chapter 1, verse 7. Throughout Exodus, we're going to see the covenant-keeping God at work. He is making a way so that a king, Jesus, would come from the seed that Abraham is going to have. As we begin our study, I want to continue also here to just think about this idea of the blessing and the curse. Israel is blessed because of the covenant. Exodus chapter 1, verse 7, they're being fruitful and multiplying and filling the land well, let's consider now Exodus, sorry, Egypt, Egypt, chapter, chapter 1, verse 8. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. We've talked about Egypt. They're blessed because of the covenant, but now... Uh, sorry, we talked about Israel, but now Egypt, they are cursed by their treatment of Israel. Egypt is going to be cursed because of their treatment of Israel. And we see this treatment begin to be laid out right here. A new king who did not know Joseph. See, Joseph had a lot of favor, but now here are these people, a people, 600,000 men, 2 million Jewish people living in the land, and there is a new king who doesn't know Joseph because Joseph has died a long time ago. And this new king has fear because of the mass of people that he sees living in the land. Now, there's nothing in the text to indicate that the people of Israel have given him any reason to fear. They are probably doing what they do. They are being faithful. They are serving. We're seeing that here they are probably increasing economic wealth for the people of Egypt as the people of Israel have done throughout the generations. And you know that's true. Even here in America, we've seen it. And so there's probably wealth being generated, there's probably faithfulness happening, and there is probably no even sense that they're going to have an uprising against the king, but the king is, fe is fearful. This is explicit fear of racism that we see here. It's an ethnic group that is rising up, and we need to deal shrewdly with them because we fear them. And throughout history, we've seen this happen over and over and over again. I can't even say, I know there's some of you from other nations that are here, and you could even talk about things I'm not going to talk about here, where we see when people fear those that they don't understand or know. Blaming the ills on the, of the world on an ethnic minority in your land, this happens all the time. With Hitler, he did it against the Jews and rallied enough support. It is so hard to believe that this ideology could take root with the people of Germany and they would do this horrible thing to the people of Israel in time. The Afrikaners in South Africa had done it. These are the Dutch and French. They would come and they lived there. This minority of people with so much power subjugating a whole nation of black people and apartheid and the evils of that, of segregation. And we see the fear that is instilled and they call it the black threat in South Africa. And of course, that has been taken care of in many ways. But it's not just black people in the world. It's also the Irish Catholics who came here fleeing uh, their nation. They didn't have food and they were oppressed. And they came here to this land and they were treated terribly here in America. We see it over and over again. And they were accused of taking all the jobs and that People are going to be robbed and raped and if they are allowed to be here. And we see even what happens there. There was this American nationalist movement that was happening under Millard Fillmore. And the history of our country shows that we fear people that come that are different than us. 
And this is happening here. I'm telling you, it is the same story repeated over and over again throughout history. And it's happening here to the people of Israel and Egypt, God's people. Fear is a powerful motivator. Fear is a powerful motivator for all of us to act in different ways. But in the same way, we don't fear these curses of natural things. We fear God. We trust God and we're willing to live a different way. Now, we talked about this idea of covenant. In the Abrahamic covenant, there's a phrase that comes up just after the phrase that I read to you, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I want to continue to read, but let me read Genesis 12, verses 1 and 2 first. It says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. But verse 3, here it is, the curse. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. See, there is a blessing and there is a curse. We don't need to fear ladders and umbrellas and black cats but you should fear the Lord and his word. And he says very explicitly, if people curse my people, they're going to be cursed. It's a promise. It is part of the covenant of God. And we see it laid out here. There is a blessing and there is a curse. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Israel, the descendants, they're experiencing the blessing of multiplying, of fruitfulness, of filling. But there is a curse coming upon Egypt the blessing and curse of God, Egypt, is going to be cursed by their treatment of Israel. See, this is background. You need to understand that this was all shared in advance. Verse 11 says, Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramses. This language, oppression, taskmasters, affliction, it's chains and bondage, it's beating, it's brutal. This is what they're facing right now. The chains of oppression are coming down upon the people of Israel. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied. You cannot stop the covenant of God. You cannot stop God. He is an unstoppable force. And the more that they did it, the promises made to Adam and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, Joseph and the generations, it is going to continue. And even the fearfulness of this Pharaoh is not going to stop it. And so they continue to be a blessing. The more they're oppressed, the more they multiplied. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. Now it's not just Pharaoh who's fearful. All of the people are in dread. They're struggling. They're fearful. God's chosen vessel for salvation for the world is feared instead of revered. Verse 13 continues, So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. It's a terrible word, isn't it? Slaves and slavery. It brings to mind so much oppression and horror. I think about chains of bondage, hard service, bitterness, challenge. Are we a blessed people? How is this a blessing to be whipped, to be captive? This doesn't make any sense. And it doesn't if you just look with your eyes to what you see in front of you. And we're going to see this throughout our time in Exodus. You have to Look at the long game, what's happening in God's plan of redemption. Being a brickmaker is a terrible job. It is filthy, it is muddy. There's straw and there's water and there's mud and you're mixing it. And then you're doing this work under the hot sun. You make these bricks that are about a foot long and six inches deep and six inches wide. And you put them out under the hot sun and they're drying there. And you take these and you need millions and millions of these bricks. And now they have free labor. The people of Israel, and they make their life so hard as they oppress them into servitude. And the chains continue to just drag around them. I want you to think for a moment. Just take your mind to a place 
your own life, what it would be like as you're living fruitful here in the land and somebody comes into your house and says, you're coming with us because of who you are and you're going to now be oppressed and you're going to be beaten and your kids are taken from you over here to work in this group and you're over here and this is what the people of Israel are facing. Are we a blessed people or not? Can you imagine them being torn apart from their families, forced to do these horrible things, treated as slaves, but you cannot crush or blot out the covenant-keeping work of God. It cannot be stopped. And this is what we see happening. I know some families here have experienced the horrors, what I'm talking about, where a brutal dictator comes in and says that they're going to do something because they want to do it. We have families in our church who were in Cuba, and they had, we saw testimonies about this. They had businesses, and they had homes, and everything was taken from them. And they had to flee that country. In Romania, people right here, they had to crawl. They had to escape because brutal dictators wanted to kill Christians. They made their way out. Is this blessing? Is this what covenant is all about? The questions would come, but you can't stop the work of God. Some dictator with a grand plan of how they're going to make everything better and then leaving everything worse. And this is what's happening in Egypt. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua. When you serve as midwife to the Hebrew woman and see that they're on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. The king is not satisfied with the oppression there. He wants now to launch into a genocide. Kill the sons. Kill the boys. So sad to see, but this has been the history of the Jewish people throughout all of their history. The Bible records instances of this. This is just the first of it, but it's coming again and again, over and over. 20th century, 6 million Jewish people killed in the Holocaust. My father was alive when it happened. He was a child, but he was alive. It's not that long ago, if you think about it. The example of God who has a people, and they are oppressed. Often it is part of a plan that can be very difficult. Some of your fathers and grandfathers fought in wars to free, to stop this oppression of people like Hitler. Reading this story, I can't help but think about the generations we've considered, Adam and Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, 400 years of fruitful, of being multiplied, of filling, of waiting for the seed to come who is going to crush the head of Satan. But until then, a lot of times it feels like we're getting crushed. That's the story of the Bible. But the plan is working. Don't lose heart. The people of Israel are being fruitful and multiplying, and the situation is going to change. There's an encouragement for me when I read the Bible to keep on going. I watched some concert footage of Rich Mullins a long time ago. I really loved Rich Mullins and his writing and his singing. And uh, In this concert video, I can still picture him there, and he was talking about um, oppression in the world and even how we read the Bible. And He said this story. He said one time somebody asked the theologian Karl Barth, uh, why do you believe in God? And he answered, because of the Jews. And they said to him, what do you mean? And Karl Barth said, well, find me a Hittite in New York City. Slow to get it. It was the same way when Rich Mullins shared the joke. There's um, some of you are going to go out to lunch later today, and you may go to Kaufman's Deli. You may go over to Howard Street Inn and get a Reuben. My daughter loves to make matzo ball soup. You probably won't be going to some Moabite diner after you leave here today. That's the punchline of the joke, is that God is with his people. And that's why I believe in God, Karl Barth was mentioning tongue-in-cheek. If this plan had succeeded, Pharaoh would have wiped out the Hebrew people. Just imagine a future generation of men would be dead The girls, they could eventually be married to the Egyptian slaves. And now we have this new 
thing going on here. And that you take away the boys, you kill them at a young age. There are no warriors to rise up when in his fear it's going to happen. Some of you feel like you're under a curse right now. Some of you feel like life is just too hard. And sometimes it is because of things outside of your control. There is just trial. There is struggle. There's health and there's job loss and there's family relationships. Sometimes it's your own fault, but other times you can't do anything about what is happening. And you feel like it's a curse right now in your life. And um, for those of you like that, I just say continue to submit to the God who had a long game in mind and who will not have you there forever because there is redemption coming for you. There is salvation on the other side of this trial, but there's some of you who are in your feelings of curse right now because you live in disobedience. It's because you continue to have anger and unforgiveness. It's because you are so challenging to be around yourself. It's because you have patterns of sin that you just won't let go of. And this disobedience is making it feel like there is a curse upon you because of the things that you continue to do, your selfishness. Well, these things can be changed in a moment, in an instant, with repentance, with forgiveness that God is willing to offer. Bless the Lord and bless God's people if you want blessing. Continuing on, verse 17. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and let the male children live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and they give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families, the blessing and curse of God. Now let's look at the midwives here. The midwives, they are blessed by their fear of God. Blessed by their fear of God. Israel is blessed because of the covenant of God. Egypt is cursed because of their treatment of God's people. And now the midwives are blessed because of their fear of God. You see a pattern emerging here. When you submit to God, when you love God, when you fear God, you are a blessed person. Now, this is the first time we see the mention of the word God in the Bible. I mark it in red, and as I go through, it's the first time here. It's just God. It's an interesting thing to do sometimes, you know, as you're reading. You don't always have to put this, but there's a, a hermeneutic, a way of studying the Scripture that talks about first mentions. And so here, I think it's interesting to me that in Exodus, the first mention of God, not that God wasn't there, but the first mention of God comes with these midwives, these women. So you should take attention, you should take note here, but the midwives feared God. The first people of Israel is noted here in Exodus, and now the first mention of God is noted by these midwives. The reason they let the babies live, they let the boys live is because they feared God. Pharaoh feared Israel and he wanted to kill the babies. These midwives feared God and they said, we're going to let the babies live. It's incredible what fear can do. Fear can cause you to do terrible things in response as we see what Egypt has done, but Fear of God can also bring about beauty. This is, I believe, the first recorded act of civil disobedience in history. Recorded, I don't know, or the Bible at least. Here's an unjust law, all right? Here's an unjust law that we are not going to follow because there is a supreme law, God's law. And God says we shouldn't kill babies. And so we're not going to do it, and so they act civil disobediently against Pharaoh to show that Pharaoh is not in control. See, fear causes you to do a lot of things. People lie because they're afraid. People steal because they're afraid. People cover up things because they're afraid. People make bad decisions because they are afraid. And when you're afraid and you don't know the future, 
Sometimes you do things that are crazy and the result of it gets you to a worse place than if you had just submitted to God in the first place. But fear of God is something different. When you fear God, great things happen. When you fear God, your future is being formed. Fearing man versus fearing God. Egypt feared man. Strange to think, because usually when you talk about fear of man, you feel like a king wouldn't fear man, but he's fearing man. Fearing man versus fearing God. Fearing man is to place the main importance on people. It's when we allow people to have power over us and it changes our behavior. Um, most of the time, it's not with this king fearing man in this way. Most of the time for us, it's like this. I fear man, and so my fear of what you're going to think of me will make me not act a certain way or will make me act a certain way. Peer pressure is all about fear of man. It's so hard being a child. I was a kid in school too, and peer pressure is a hard thing in school. Parents should talk to the children about peer pressure and just understand it is so hard to say no when others are saying yes to things because we fear man. When we fear man, we want to fit in. We're not saying the truth because we fear what people will say and they'll reject us. We want to follow popular people and we allow those with wealth to have power over us. All these things are examples of fearing man. But if you want to fear God, if you want to grow in a fear of God, first thing you got to do is you got to know God. Just know God. Know who he is. You'll know that he's compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. He is awesome. He is loving, loved so much. He sent Jesus. He's a beautiful savior. I was loving the songs we were singing, thinking about Jesus, and I could see you. I can see you now. I could see him. I had my eyes closed. I could picture Jesus serving and loving. Know God. Know God. Fear God. Strive for holiness. Just strive to be a person who is holy, and as you strive for holiness, you're fearing God because you're saying, I want to do what you want me to do. Do the right thing even when it's hard. Even when it's not popular, do the right thing. Accept responsibility for your own sin. Say, I did wrong. Let me ask for forgiveness of God and of you. Speak the truth respectfully. Respectfully, but if they are opposing truth, you should speak up. It shows that you have fear of God. When things are out of your control, trust God. If you want to fear God. We went to a funeral yesterday friend we've known for, you know, years and years, 27 years married, 57 years old, and died unexpectedly, and I tell you, a funeral will make you fear God. I was there. It happens at every funeral I'm in. I always think about my life. and What would they say about me? Am I living my life in a good way? Do I love you, God? Why do I care about this stock market right now? Paul doesn't care a thing about the stock market right now. Fear God, right? Death and funeral will do that. When you fear God, you seek to obey his ways, and you really want to honor him. Is your life marked by an earnest desire to follow after God and remain faithful to him like these midwives? We don't know if they're Hebrew or Egyptian. Not sure. Warren Wiersbe says they're Hebrew, as I do my study, I look at other commentators after I'm done with my prep and see what other people are saying. Another commentator said they weren't. I don't know. I don't care much. All we know is they're mentioned by name. And they feared God. They feared God. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this? And let the male children live. The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. See, they cover up the truth. They don't tell Pharaoh what is really true. Some of you are like, I can't believe they bore false witness. They lied. They lied. Isn't that sinful? They lied. And so all I can say to you is, just look at the next verse. The next verse. We see it right here in the next sentence. So God dealt well with the midwives. That's all I need to know. That's all I need to know. You're like, all right, I don't get it. I know we're not supposed to lie, but man, they lied to save a bunch of children. And God was okay with it. God was okay with it. God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. 
Because of their fear of God, they get a blessing. Because they feared God, they get an opportunity to continue this seed that is going to move on and move on. We're in our last verse of chapter 1. The book of Exodus has so much foreshadowing to what is to come. The echoes of Christ and his redemption are all throughout the book of Exodus. And I find right here what I thought was the first of these. And in our study, we're going to revisit these themes regularly. And chapter, uns, chapter 1 ends with this. Verse 22, then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every son that is born to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. So this is what I want to close with here, the last thought here, blessing and curse of God. Jesus cursed to secure God's blessing for us. Jesus is cursed to secure God's blessing for us. For us. This is a foreshadowing of what is to come. These, this resonates with what happens even when Jesus was born. Can't you go back in your mind to think about what happened? See, the resurrected Christ, he was born to Mary and Joseph, and he was born there in humble estate, in low estate, and then he ended up dying to save us from our sins. Well, when Jesus was born, there's a king named Herod, another king who feared God's people. And that king, he did something very similar to what this Pharaoh did. It's a foreshadowing. He called for the death, a mass genocide of the innocent lives of these children right around Jesus' birth. Let's look at Matthew chapter 2, verse 13. It says this, Now when they had departed, this is now Jesus. Jesus is born. And these people come and they want to worship Jesus. And, and uh, Herod says, When you find him, go tell me where he is so that I might come and worship the child too. Matthew chapter 2, verse 13 says, Now when they had departed, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his... Sometimes you, you, know, you, you just get the image, I just a flash of Jesus and Joseph and Mary and the king of kings born. And they've got to run for their life. We're blessed. What Joseph have said. Took him, the mother, by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious. And he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem. And all in all that region. Are we blessed? We rush over these passages of scripture, but children are dying. Two years old and under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they were no more. In the same way that Pharaoh, this wicked king, is out to destroy the covenant people of God. Herod also does the same thing. And he wants to destroy Jesus this last verse is a foreshadowing of what is to come. One day, a redeemer is going to come, and he will rise up, and he will set the captives free. The blessing and curse of God. Just consider this, Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham, oh, we have a covenant-keeping God. 
might come to the Gentiles, that's most of us here in this room today, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith, through faith in Jesus, the blessing and curse of God. Jesus became a curse on the tree that we would receive the blessing of Almighty God. Glory to God. 